At the end of 1905, a young Irishman sent a manuscript of 12 short stories entitled Dubliners to an English publisher, hoping for early publication. But it was to be almost a decade before the ambitious and impecunious author would see his book in print, and then only after so many delays and disappointments that the actual appearance of the work must have seemed to him something of an anticlimax. This dismal chapter in publishing history ran as follows. After an initial commitment, the English publisher Grant Richards developed serious qualms about the book's contents, as his author, James Joyce, submitted new tales for inclusion in the promised volume. His printer, too, was fearful that Joyce's realism about sexual matters would offend contemporary taste and lay both printer and publisher open to legal penalty. So author and publisher entered on a protracted correspondence in which a compromise was sought, in vain, between artistic integrity and commercial pusillanimity. In 1909, Joyce had given up on Richards and had placed his manuscript in the hands of an Irish publishing house, Monsell and Company, where history was repeated as farce. This time the book got as far as the print stage, only for the complete edition to be destroyed at the very last moment as, once again, a printer and publisher took fright, reckoning now with the possibility of libel actions on account of its many references to living persons. Finally, in 1914, Richards took his courage in his hands and issued the book without suffering any of the dire consequences he had earlier envisaged. This delayed publication undoubtedly affected the book's reception. A work begun when the author was a mere 22-year-old graduate of University College Dublin and completed with the composition of The Dead in 1907, when Joyce was all of 25, did not appear until the author's 33rd year. By that time, he was already attracting admiration as a novelist, with the serial publication of A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man in The Egoist. This new work rather overshadowed Joyce's collection of stories, for at that time, the longer fictional form enjoyed greater critical esteem than the short story, even when it was given to the world in a coherent collection. So it was not readily recognized that Dubliners constituted a milestone in the history of short prose fiction and a remarkable and precocious achievement in its own right. Indeed, for many years, Dubliners continued to languish somewhat in the shadow of Joyce's other fictions, A Portrait, Ulysses, and Finnegan's Wake, generating only rather grudging critical attention when so much more ample and complex work awaited explication and assessment. The young man who began work on Dubliners in 1904 was the first surviving son and eldest child of a family of ten children, which blessed, if that is the word, the marriage of John Stanislaus Joyce and Mary Jane Murray. May. John Joyce hailed from Cork City in the southern province of Munster, while his wife was a Leitrim woman from the predominantly rural province of Connacht in the west of the country. Joyce Pear was a man of some marked social gifts. Singer, raconteur, personality, colourful frequenter of public houses, but signally deficient in the matter of earning a living. Despite the responsibilities laid upon him by his wife's frequent pregnancies, six girls and four boys survived the 15 pregnancies, which James Joyce believed hastened his mother's early death in 1903. John Joyce consistently lived beyond his means, and through mortgages and unwise investments, managed to dissipate his family's inheritance, which depended on properties in Cork. Driven to the desperate expedient of actually working for a living, John Joyce, through political connections, found himself a position as a collector of rates in Dublin. This post allowed him plenty of time for gossip and for enjoying the lore and back chat of the city, but paid insufficiently to meet the needs of his burgeoning family. Even this tenuous hold on the world of secure employment was broken in 1892 when John Joyce's position was discontinued and he was forced to retire on a less than ample pension, only granted after May Joyce had played the dire state of the family finances, of about £132 per annum. In 1904, the year after his mother's death, Joyce wrote bitterly to Nora Barnacle, 
the young Galway woman he was to invite to share a life of social and intellectual rebellion with him in exile on the continent. My mind rejects the whole present social order and Christianity, home, the recognized virtues, classes of life, and religious doctrines. How could I like the idea of home? My home was simply a middle-class affair ruined by spendthrift habits which I have inherited. My mother was slowly killed, I think, by my father's ill-treatment, by years of trouble, and by my cynical frankness of conduct. When I looked on her face as she lay in her coffin, a face grey and wasted with cancer, I understood that I was looking on the face of a victim, and I cursed the system which had made her a victim. Life Shay Joyce had not always been so dreadful an affair as the young and self-accusing writer characterized it in this angry outburst. Joyce himself had been born on the 2nd of February, 1882, in the family home at 41 Brighton Square in the Dublin suburb of Rathgar. This square of recently built houses was located in a respectable district of the city, and the house itself was eminently suitable for a middle-class family with a private income. The family soon removed to Bray, after a sojourn at the equally respectable address in Rath Mines nearby, a pleasant seaside resort in County Wicklow, about ten miles south of the city, where they took a large house on Martello Terrace that was at least the social equal of the houses in Rathgar and Rath Mines they had vacated. Here they lived in some style, employing not only servants, but a governess for the young children. The Joyces were, in fact, comfortably placed members of a class new to Irish life, Catholic bourgeois of strong nationalist outlook who expected home rule, which was surely imminent, to enter them on their true inheritance as an elite in the emerging Irish political and social structure. Education played a crucial part in their aspirations, and the Jesuit order was regarded as the agency most likely to prepare their sons for coming triumphs. James Joyce was accordingly enrolled as a boarder in the Jesuit-run Clongos Wood College in County Kildare in September 1888, when he was six years old. Here he remained, apart of course from holidays, until the decisive year of 1891, when reverses in the family fortunes became definitive, and the boy had to be removed from Clongos because of a paternal inability to meet the fees demanded there. As if this indignity was not enough to highlight the rapidly deteriorating circumstances the family now experienced, in 1893, the young James would find himself, for a brief period, enrolled as a pupil in a school run by the Christian brothers. This teaching order supplied a notoriously robust education for the children of the Irish poor. John Joyce snobbishly identified their constituency as Paddy Stink and Mickey Mud. Joyce never subsequently mentioned his time under their tutelage, and fortunately, his Jesuit education was continued when, in April 1893, he was enabled, through the generosity of the order itself, to begin attendance at Belvedere College on the north side of central Dublin, where he was to remain until 1898. This hiatus in James's educational progression under the aegis of the Jesuit order had occurred as two other seismic events shook such emotional security as the young boy had enjoyed to that date. The one was entirely personal to the Joyce family, the other was an event of national significance. The year 1891 saw the financial crisis, which meant the removal in early 1892 of the Joyce menage from their family home in Bray to a house in Carriesfort Avenue on the south side of the city. It was the first visible crack in the edifice of a family life that was soon to be shaken to its foundations. For within a couple of years, the Joyces were to make a further removal with the necessary haste which was to mark all their subsequent flits through the city, from that comparatively respectable address to the north side of the River Liffey. The river then marked, as it does now, a social divide between the indisputably respectable and the doubtfully so, Thus, the young boy, who to that date had enjoyed the salubrious environs of Bray in the holiday from Clongos, was to be exposed not only to familial and financial insecurity, but to a Dublin of mean dwellings, low public houses, 
and slum tenements with their teeming populations, houses of ill repute and grinding poverty. He was to get to know, too, a Dublin of lower middle class desperation in the crowded streets of north central Dublin, Drumcondra and Fairview, a city life hitherto unknown to Irish literature. The shock delivered to the sensitive boy by this social transition must, one imagines, have been akin to that famously suffered by the English writer Charles Dickens when his equally improvident father was imprisoned for debt and the future novelist was set to work in a blacking factory. Joyce never forgot this trauma. This is evident, it can convincingly be argued, in his lifelong fascination with the theme of betrayal, which focused on the fate of the Irish political leader Charles Stuart Parnell, whose political career reached its climacteric in the same year as the Joycean Day Marsh. Parnell's death in October 1891 ended the hopes and expectations of those like John Joyce, members of the Catholic nationalist middle class, who had reckoned their future as intimately bound up with the success of Parnell's skillfully fought parliamentary campaign for Irish home rule, which would have allowed the country, in a devolved government, a significant degree of legislative independence from Westminster. Thereafter, Joyce, father and son, would associate, in a way which seemed to come from springs of grievance and resentment which were less than fully rational, the collapse in the Joyce fortunes and the immiseration endured by the family in the wake of their own undignified experience with the sufferings heaped upon Parnell in his final months. The chief, as Parnell was known, had been forsaken by a majority of the Irish Parliamentary Party at the behest of ecclesiastical opinion in Ireland and non-conformist prudery in Britain when his adulterous relationship with a married woman, Catherine O'Shea, became public knowledge. The Joyce family, who should have been pillars of society in the new Ireland Parnell had fought for, find itself by contrast in a kind of exile in rented accommodation on the unfashionable north side of the city, shamefully assailed by creditors and importunate landlords. James Joyce's Parnellite loyalties and his obsession with the act of betrayal find bitter expression in Dubliners in Ivy Day in the committee room with its comprehensive indictment of the casual, treacherous corruption of Irish political life in 1902, in contrast to the noble idealism of the dead chief, Parnell. In writing such a work, Joyce was bringing together a personal and national sense of betrayal and outrage that had their origins in his own experience as a boy in Dublin a decade before. It was not only Joyce's experience of social decline and Parnellite disillusionment that found its way into Dubliners. This text, like all of Joyce's work, contains autobiographical matter and is rooted in an intensely accurate apprehension of the detail of the Dublin life Joyce had observed all about him as he grew to adulthood. Many incidents and characters can be shown to have their origins in real personalities whom Joyce would have known and to be based on experiences he and others had undergone, though only an encounter and a mother were based on Joyce's direct personal experience. Indeed, he drew with almost clinical dispassion on the experiences and even the private diary of his long-suffering brother Stanislaus, who was to be a financial mainstay of the Joyce household in its European wanderings for many a year. It was Stanislaus who afforded a model for Mr. Duffy in A Painful Case, as Joyce imagined what might become of him in a later life of unfruitful bachelorhood. And his brother's experience in a political by-election in which he served as a canvasser along with his father in 1902 is also the basis for some of the detail in Ivy Day in the committee room. Stanislaus Joyce himself records, confirming how intently his brother sought accurate data for his fictional realism, that the detailed acquaintance with office life which some of the stories show, as well as the end of one of them, counterparts, he got from my diary and more fully from me in conversation. The Mrs. Morkin in The Dead were undoubtedly based on his own great aunts who had kept a kind of finishing school for young ladies at Usher's Island where the story is set. This story suggests how the author of Dubliners did not hesitate to draw even on personal details of those closest to him for his fiction.
for the girlhood of his own Nora Barnacle supplied the Galway background for his portrayal of young love in that searchingly emotional tale. Dubliners is the work of a young man who, as his brother Stanislaus records, did not scruple to read through his mother's letters a week or so after her death, offering only a curt and, as Stanislaus believed, contemptuous nothing as commentary on their contents. From quite early on, there was something about James Joyce's personality which bespoke a capacity to respond to life, even at its most terrible, with the intrigued, calculating imperviousness of an artist for whom nothing real is beyond his purview. For in the midst of trauma, alcoholism, familial violence and disintegration, Joyce maintained a cheerful resolution of temperament, which came from sources of self-belief that could not be shaken by the storms which raged about him. He was, his brother wrote in a diary entry in 1903, a genius of character and possessed extraordinary moral courage which expressed itself in a scornful disregard for conventional opinion for what Joyce termed the rabblement. His instinct was for the truth of life as he saw it, and his moral engagement involved him in a search for modes of artistic expression which would serve that truth, whatever the consequences. An early ideal was the Norwegian dramatist Henrik Ibsen, 1828-1906, about whose play, When We Dead Awaken, Joyce wrote an admiring review article during his second year as a student at University College Dublin, where he had matriculated when he left Belvedere College in 1898. The 18-year-old undergraduate had the gratification of seeing his essay published in the widely read English Fortnightly Review, to whose editor he had ambitiously dispatched it, bringing him to the attention of the great man himself. Joyce had made an auspicious beginning. What the developing artist in Joyce responded to in Ibsen was the defiant realism of his vision. He tended to ignore in his enthusiasm the symbolic qualities of Ibsen's dramaturgy and the independence of mind which underlay it. From Ibsen he received essential instruction that out of the dreary sameness of existence a measure of dramatic life may be drawn. The portrait of a dismal, enervated provincial world that Joyce draws in Dubliners must owe its exacting, diagnostic realism in part to Joyce's admiration for those plays by Ibsen in which the lives of the Norwegian living dead are seen steadily and whole as from a great height with perfect vision and angelic dispassionateness with the sight of one who may look on the sun with open eyes. In Joyce's youthful view, Ibsen had chosen the average lives in their uncompromising truth for the groundwork of all his later plays. In Dubliners, he emulated the master, and accordingly it must have been almost insufferable to him that the prudery and caution of publishers in London and Dublin delayed publication of a work which he believed, with Ibsenite zeal, represented a chapter of the moral history of his country. So he wrote to Grant Richards, as that pusillanimous soul hesitated, with the conviction of an artistic Mr. Valiant for Truth, whose weapon is an uncompromising realism. It is not my fault that the odour of ash pits and old weeds and offal hangs round my stories. I seriously believe that you will retard the course of civilization in Ireland by preventing the Irish people from having one good look at themselves in my nicely polished looking glass. Therefore, it is clear that Joyce intended Dubliners, at the very least, to be a realist study of his native city, a work representative of Irish experience conducted with unflinching Ibsenite moral rigor. Writing to William Heinemann, to whom he had first sent the manuscripts in hopes of publication, he insisted, the book is not a collection of tourist impressions, but an attempt to represent certain aspects of the life of one of the European capitals. To his brother Stanislaus, he wrote in the same month, reinforcing the point, When you remember that Dublin has been a capital for thousands of years, that it is the second city of the British Empire, that it is nearly three times as big as Venice, it seems strange that no artist has given it to the world. The Dublin, which in the early 20th century lay open to the inspection of Joyce's realism, was a city of some 300,000 persons, it was a city which certainly exhibited much evidence of its significance in the scheme of things, being endowed with much splendid architecture 
and an urban layout that allowed its citizens to appreciate its magnificent setting on the River Liffey, between the open arms of a great bay and beneath the rolling mountains of County Wicklow to the south. Many of Dublin's most distinguished buildings dated from the 18th century. The four courts and the custom house which dominated the north bank of the river, the Bank of Ireland on College Green which had housed an independent parliament in the last decades of that century. But the city also boasted two medieval cathedrals, two universities, one the Elizabethan Foundation of Trinity College Dublin, the other the more recently established University College Dublin, offspring of John Henry Newman's educational experiment in the 1850s. Even after the city's 19th century decline from the glories of the late 18th century, when it was a seat of native government, however restricted the franchise which elected it, there remained several noble squares, Merrion Square, St. Stephen's Green, Fitzwilliam Square, which made the city an urban masterpiece that allowed it to be compared with Bath in England and even with Italian Venice, which Joyce invoked in his letter to Stanislaus. The 18th century Wide Streets Commission had also bequeathed to the city's citizens a street pattern of ready access and spacious vistas so that Dublin was very much a walker city. Note in Dubliners, as in Ulysses, how much time the characters spend on their feet or on brief journeys by cab or tram so that peregrination becomes almost a principle of composition, which could fairly easily be negotiated, even in the course of a day's business by foot. The city that Joyce chose as his literary subject matter for all its graciousness and fortunate physical settings had by the early 20th century endured almost a century of decline. This perhaps accounts for the fact that the Dubliners of Joyce's text seem unconscious of the city's charms, thereby reflecting contemporary taste that had not yet been altered to the attractions of Georgian architecture. A guidebook of the period advised the street architecture of Dublin is not beautiful, the houses generally being of the uninteresting Georgian period. The Act of Union of 1801 at the end of the Georgian century had reduced the city's importance in the British Isles as the seat of a native Irish legislature and the economic difficulties experienced by the country at large in an era of free trade and burgeoning transport facilities had taken their toll on the city too. As the historian of Dublin's decline has it, at the time of the Union, Dublin was easily the second largest city in the British Isles and among the ten largest cities in Europe. By 1860, she was merely fifth in the UK rankings and by the end of the century was to suffer the ultimate indignity of being overtaken by upstart Belfast as Ireland's largest city. Symptoms of stagnation and concomitant human misery were not hard to find. Because the city lacked any really productive industrial base, the 200,000 or more of working people that constituted the great majority of its inhabitants were forced to depend for employment on the building industry, on such concerns as biscuit making and brewing, on domestic service, casual labouring and carrying, and on work on the docks. This latter reflected the fact that Dublin was an important entrepot for the country as a whole. But even in this sphere, the late 19th century saw decline and failure to meet competition from new sources. Gabriel Conroy's father in The Dead was an employee of the influential Dublin Port and Docks Board, which regulated the work of the port. By 1907, the port, which had been of long-standing significance in the growth of the city, had to play second fiddle in terms of growth to both Belfast and Cork in the north and south of the country. But the decline in the docks was only one element in a generally dismal picture, summarized as follows by Mary E. Daly. The lack of dynamism from the rural Irish economy and the failure of Dublin businesses to manufacture and in some cases even to distribute the manufactured goods which rural Ireland needed, plus the apparent stagnation of the port in the third quarter of the 19th century, all meant that Dublin failed to provide adequate employment either for the indigenous population or even for a small proportion of the surplus population of rural Ireland. Many of the city's labouring and unemployed poor lived in the tenements for which the city was notorious. These were squalid, decaying Georgian townhouses on streets and squares on the north side of the river in central Dublin, which had once been the height of fashion, 
but by the early 20th century were given over to slum. early 20th century were given over to slum conditions of the worst kind. As FSL Lyons has recorded, over 30% of these tenements consisted of single rooms. Estimates of the average number living, eating and sleeping in these rooms varied from 3 to 6, though cases of from 7 to 12 were by no means uncommon. Up to 100 people could live in a single tenement house, Often there would only be one cold tap in a yard or passage, and the facilities for sewage disposal were unspeakably inadequate. Unsurprisingly, Dublin had both a disgracefully high infant mortality rate and the highest death rate in the country. We get only glimpses of the desperately poor or of the labouring masses in Dubliners. In an encounter, we meet ragged girls and ragged boys, probably inmates of one of the many orphanages and charitable institutions that were a necessity in such a city. In Araby, we hear of the rough tribes from the cottages. In A Little Cloud, Little Chandler, the hero, if such he can be called, walks after work down Henrietta Street in north-central Dublin amidst a horde of grimy children. They stood or ran in the roadway or crawled up the steps before the gaping doors or squatted like mice upon the thresholds. He picked his way deftly through all that minute vermin-like life, and under the shadow of the gaunt spectral mansions in which the old nobility of Dublin had roistered. And in Two Gallants, Lenehan finds himself in a cafe patronized by working people whose demeanor makes him embarrassed at his own, not especially developed, gentility of manner. But if actual references to this huge underclass in Dublin's life are few in Dubliners, such brief allusions to a dominating social reality, widespread and apparently unmitigable immiseration, gave one to understand why the characters in his grimly realistic work view even loathsome or dispiriting employment with such proprietorial concern. Mr. Doran, for example, in The Boarding House, accedes to a not-so-tender trap which will have him married to a woman he does not love, lest in disgrace he should lose his job. And Farrington, in Counterparts, gets violently drunk in self-disgust when he has been forced to offer an abject apology to his superior at work after a moment's futile rebellion. For the unemployed and underpaid, there are only the desperate stratagems of a Lenehan in Two Gallants, knocking about, pulling the devil by the tail, shifts and intrigues, or of a Mr. McCoy in Grace, who borrows luggage for proposed concert tours to be undertaken by his singer spouse, only to pawn it forthwith to augment his income. And there is too the kind of precarious hold on gentility which allows the Morkin sisters in The Dead to keep up a show of middle-class hospitality, at least at Christmas, even though they live over a corn factor's premises in rented accommodation. For Joyce in Dubliners concentrates his attention on a fairly narrow strand of Dublin society. The lower middle class, petty bourgeois world of shopkeepers and tradesmen, functionaries of one kind or another, clerks, bank officials, salesmen like Mr. Kernan in Grace, who sells as well as tastes tea for a living. Their world is one of rented rooms and houses in less than fashionable areas of the city, of furniture bought on the higher purchase system, of boarding houses, offices and public houses. In the early years of the century, the city boasted about 800 licensed premises, where they eke out their dismal and often insecure lives. When we have noted the hotel at which Seguin stays and where Jimmy dines in after the race, the Gresham Hotel, where the Conroys spend the night after the Mrs. Morkin's Christmas party, and observe that Gabriel and Miss Ivers are graduates of the Royal University, we have scaled the social heights to which Joyce's characters attain in this book. At the bottom of the ladder, by contrast, are the Skivvy in Two Gallants, and Lily, the caretaker's daughter, in The Dead, who probably both exist on the edge of that cruel poverty, which was the lot of the majority of the city's inhabitants.
and which gave an added intensity to natural lower middle class anxiety about economic survival. Such social ambition as Joyce's characters can reasonably entertain in Dubliners is represented by Jimmy's Novu Rich father in After the Race, who has made a fortune in the grocery trade supplying police contracts. Jack Power in Grace, the arc of whose social rise has elevated him to a post in the Royal Irish Constabulary Office in Dublin Castle, and by Father Flynn in The Sisters, and Constantine Conroy, Gabriel's brother in The Dead who have achieved the social respectability of priesthood in a society where the taking of holy orders offered advancement for the upwardly mobile. It was not, of course, that Dubliners of the kind that Joyce chose to write about were constitutionally deficient in the desire to improve themselves or to advance their children in the world. Class consciousness is a recurrent motif. Rather, the Dublin of the early years of the century was economically in serious decline and its energies were restrained by the limits placed upon ambition by a caste system which operated with almost comprehensive efficiency. The population of Dublin in the first decade of this century was about 17% Protestant, while the rest was Catholic. That Protestant minority included the ruling elite, whose loyalty to the union between Ireland and Great Britain was unquestioned and certainly understandable since the Union protected their own position in a strikingly inequitable social order. It was they who constituted the upper levels of society in Dublin and who largely controlled entry to the major professions of law and medicine. They were powerful too in banking and in business, in brewing and distilling and in biscuit making, for example. They would indeed have reserved the poorer Protestants many of the better paid jobs in the government bodies, which, under the authority of the Viceroy, with his residence in the Phoenix Park in the city, administered both the city and the country at large. The excluded were not only those suspected of disloyalty, those of advanced nationalist or Republican sympathies, but many Catholics whose only wish for themselves was that they could work and live at a decent level in their own city. For many such, only the world of clerking, serving as a shop assistant or as a low paid official in some government office stood between them and the kind of undignified scrounging practiced by the Corleys and Lenehans of this economically depressed and unjust world. If economic life in the city for the majority of the city's inhabitants is adequately represented by the crowd of spectators who, in After the Race, form a channel of poverty and inaction through which the continent spared its wealth and industry, we can readily understand then why money plays a distinctive role in this text. We learn here that Evelyn earns a weekly wage of seven shillings, that Mrs. Mooney's young men in the boarding house pay 15 shillings a week for board and lodgings, that Farrington is so far gone in alcoholic dependency in counterparts that he spends six shillings, having pawned his watch, on drink in one evening, which must represent a substantial drain on his family's only visible means of support. We learn too that Maria in Clay has two half crowns and some coppers, pennies, in her purse when she steps out for her evening visit. The fact that she expends almost half this sum on an intended present which she leaves on the tram adds, of course, a note of pathetic extravagance to this tale of frustration and evasion. For the world of Dubliners is economically exiguous, a place of venal money-grabbing, fiscal prudence and aggressive financial insistence. Little Chandler in A Little Cloud still has the furniture to pay for. The electoral workers in Ivy Day in the committee room labour for meagre payment or the small reward of a bottle or two of stout, while Kathleen Kearney's father in A Mother, by paying a small sum every week into a society, insured for both his daughters a dowry of £100 each when they came to the age of 24 which doesn't, of course, inhibit Kathleen's mother from loudly insisting that her daughter be paid a full fee of eight guineas, even when a depleted concert hall audience makes it unlikely that the management can meet its commitments. All of which gives a peculiar relevance to the work as a whole of the gold coin in Two Gallants, which reveals to us the full parasitical horror of the relationships explored in that grim study of colonial degradation. For Joyce in Dubliners does not fail to identify the source of much of the human misery he so clinically diagnoses.
The coin in question is a gold sovereign with its association of regal power, sovereignty and ultimate authority. Corley and Lenehan, in their circular peregrinations about the city in pursuit of their unworthy ends, traverse a public domain dominated by the buildings and the street names associated with that Anglo-Irish Protestant ascendancy, which served as the bulwark of British power in the land. It is outside the Kildare Street Club, bastion of ascendancy, influence and prejudice, that they come on a symbol of their nation's servitude and abuse, as if to indict a polity in which they themselves are representative victims, even as they exemplify the grosser forms of moral turpitude. They walked along Nassau Street and then turned into Kildare Street. Not far from the porch of the club, a harpist stood in the roadway, playing to a little ring of listeners. He plucked at the wires heedlessly, glancing quickly from time to time at the face of each newcomer, and from time to time, wearily also, at the sky. His harp, too, heedless that her coverings had fallen about her knees, seemed weary alike of the eyes of strangers and of her master's hands. The image of Ireland as a wronged woman, which this passage brings to mind, links Joyce, in fact, with a tradition of nationalism in which Ireland has variously been entered as the poor old woman, the hag of Berra, and Kathleen Nee Houlihan. All legendary figures in the tragic narratives the country's history has generated. But there is perhaps a more immediate pertinence in this choice of imagery in a text where it is women who so frequently bear the brunt of male oppression, which in the sexual sphere may be the moral and actual equivalent of imperial domination in the political. Although only three of the 15 stories offer a woman as a central character, and although the first three stories all dealing with the growth to consciousness of a young boy, and the final story, The Dead, with Gabriel Conroy's framing conclusive vision, seem to valorize the masculine viewpoint in the narrative perspectives of the work as a whole, the reader is aware through much of the book that it is women who suffer the most severe victimage in the narrow confines of this disabling social milieu. It is Evelyn's mother whose life of commonplace sacrifices closes in final craziness, no critic has yet suggested that the famous crux Deravon Saron may be read as a tragic instance of écriture féminine. It is Maria who must unknowingly await the death that the auguries have forecast. It is Mrs. Sinico in a painful case who dies an undignified accidental death, which is the stuff of the coroner's court and of journalistic invasion of her private drunken misery. Throughout, we hear the accents of female distress, and we witness its terrible silences. The man that is now is only all palaver and what they can get out of you. I think he died for me. She stood still for an instant like an angry stone image. When they came out of the park, they walked in silence towards the tram, but here she began to tremble so violently that, fearing another collapse on her part, he bade her goodbye quickly and left her. Amid the seas, she sent a cry of anguish. She set her white face to him, passive like a helpless animal. Her eyes gave him no sign of love or farewell or recognition. Employment opportunities for young women in Joyce's Dublin were even more restricted than those for men. The teaching and nursing professions were almost entirely the preserves of those in religious life. Married women did manage to gain a toehold on the commercial world as shopkeepers and landladies, but the capital for such enterprises was usually supplied by inheritance or marriage. In a country where marriages were often postponed to very advanced ages indeed, marital opportunities were few. So outside of domestic service, a post as a shop assistant, secretarial work of the kind Polly Mooney undertakes for a time in the boarding house, only Dublin's rich musical life offered any real chance of a satisfying career. Dubliners, as Florence L. Walsall has noted, is full of musicians of all ages and talent. So it is not surprising that the Mrs. Morkin and Mary Jane in The Dead have made their lives in the musical world, and that Mrs. Kearney is crudely ambitious for her musical daughter in A Mother. Indeed, Dublin's musical vitality is the only aspect of civic life in the city to which Joyce seems able to extend any kind of approval. While Dublin's politics in Ivy Day in the committee room 
and its religion in the Sisters and in Grace are treated with single-minded contempt, at least its musical enthusiasms are allowed a certain sentimental charm and some dignity. Yet even music has been compromised in this depressing city by its implication in the new nationalism, which is a further object of Joyce's satiric impatience in Dubliners, as a mother makes clear. Not all Irish men and women were content to acquiesce in the provincial lethargy and colonial subjugation which Joyce so intently documented in Dubliners. In fact, in the years in which these stories are largely set, two movements brought together individuals who were earnest to ameliorate Ireland's lot through political and cultural endeavour. The first of these was the Irish Ireland movement, at its most political in the foundation of Common the Nile. Confederation of the Gales, by Arthur Griffith in 1900 to develop the ideal of self-reliance, and at its most cultural in the Gaelic revivalism of the Gaelic League, founded 1893, which sought to encourage national self-confidence through nativism of outlook and linguistic program. And secondly, since the 1880s, the Irish literary revival, the cultural brainchild of W.B. Yeats, Lady Gregory, and their literary confederates, had sought to reinvigorate a depleted Irish cultural condition through contact with an ancient Celtic spirituality by means of an English language literature, which might rekindle the authentic national fire. In 1906, Joyce wrote to his brother Stanislaus about the Irish Ireland movement as it manifested itself in a new political power in the land. You ask me what I would substitute for parliamentary agitation in Ireland? I think the Sinn Féin policy would be more effective. He added, however, if the Irish program did not insist on the Irish language, I suppose I could call myself a nationalist. As it is, I am content to recognize myself an exile, and prophetically, a repudiated one. It was unlikely that Joyce's muted endorsement of Sinn Féin's abstentionist policy developed concurrently with many of the incidents recorded in Dubliners, in contrast to the parliamentary tactics of the Home Rule Party, could long have survived his exposure to the less than attractive aspects of Griffith's political personality. While there may have been something in Sinn Féin's protectionist economic theories and policy of parliamentary abstention to appeal to Joyce's nationalism, Griffith's lack of socialist feeling was a signal deficiency to a writer whose continental experience was of serious class politics in Italy. Also, to the cosmopolitan Joyce, Griffith's anti-Semitic xenophobia was intolerable. He could not have failed to recognize that Griffith's newspaper, Sinn Féin, contained noxious matter. What I object to most of all in his paper is that it is educating the people of Ireland on the old pap of racial hatred, whereas anyone can see that if the Irish question exists, it exists for the Irish proletariat chiefly. Dubliners, therefore, makes little of the cultural program of Irish Ireland, which Griffith commended to his readers. The attempt to revive the Irish language receives short shrift in Joyce's telling portrait of an enthusiast in the person of Miss Ivers in The Dead, all coquettish mischief-making and Puritan ardor. Likewise, the musical opportunism of Kathleen Kearney and her mother in A Mother provokes the Joycean contempt Soon the name of Miss Kathleen Kearney began to be heard often on people's lips. People said she was very clever at music and a very nice girl, and moreover, that she was a believer in the language movement. Miss Kearney was well content at this. So Joyce saw nothing in the cultural project of deliberate Hibernicization that Griffith and the Irish Ireland movement had in hand. It was not, however, because he held the activities of their principal rivals in the cultural field the writers and thinkers associated with the Irish literary revival, in very much greater esteem. Certainly, he leapt to the defense of Yeats and the Irish literary theater, and to the defense of Singh when their work had encountered opposition from the very forces that energized Irish Ireland, xenophobia and an aggressive puritanical nativism. But while he recognized Yeats's genius, the elder man's way of discovering an artistic vocation through contact with the soil and in an idealization of a heroic Celtic past was scarcely his, committed disciple of Ibsen and instinctive urban socialist as he was. Ancient Ireland, he asserted, is dead just as ancient Egypt is dead. 
Its death chant has been sung, and on its gravestone has been placed the seal. And while he may allow Yeats's poem, Who Goes with Fergus, to echo in Stephen Dedalus's mind in the Telemachus episode in Ulysses, Joyce was altogether less than enchanted by the poetic effusions of those many imitators of Yeats, minor Irish poets of dubious talent who, in his considerable shadow, composed poems of supposed Celtic twilight spirituality and actual inanity. Little Chandler, in A Little Cloud, imagines himself a putative part of this movement, though the fact that his dreams are all too materially of success indicates that Joyce considered the Celtic Twilight School to be opportunistic and lacking in artistic integrity. It was a means to easy literary success, especially in England. Indeed, the portrait of Little Chandler in this story may be read as a satiric commentary on the revival itself. For Little Chandler, so preoccupied with his hopes of a literary future when the English critics perhaps would recognize him as one of the Celtic school by reason of the melancholy tone of his poems, feels, as Philip Herring has recently noted, to make any real contact with the life of his own city in his walks to Corliss's public house where he will meet his erstwhile friend Ignatius Gallagher. Surrounded by the squalor and misery of Dublin, he becomes merely sad in a literary and affected manner. Little Chandler gave them no thought. He picked his way deftly through all the minute vermin-like life. Little Chandler, his mind turning to the possibility of a coterie of admirers in England for his unwritten verses, for the first time in his life he felt himself superior to the people he passed. His soul revolted against the dull inelegance of Capel Street is a damning indictment of the artistic impulses of the literary revival as the youthful Joyce understood them. They are portrayed here as evasive, condescending, and self-interested to a shocking degree. Irish Ireland ideologues, literary revival propagandists, and Joyce himself, whatever their differences, all did at least share one crucial thing, a belief that Ireland's ills had a source in English domination of the country. In fact, Joyce, the pacifist and almost lifelong exile, produced what was unquestionably the most succinct account of Ireland's case against her powerful neighbour in terms not even an ultra-nationalist could have deemed insufficiently harsh. She enkindled its factions and took over its treasury. But unlike most other Irish nationalists of whatever stripe and however zealous, he was no less cogent and outspoken in his judgments on that other power in the land, the Holy Roman Catholic and Apostolic Church, which exercised, in Joyce's view, an even more disabling, because unopposed, authority. Irish Ireland was robustly Catholic in its national chauvinism, the faith of the fathers serving as a ready rallying cry. The revival writers, mostly Protestant by background and agnostic or indifferent by inclination, while sometimes closet anti-Catholics, had to be careful not to alienate by too obvious an anti-clericalism the majority they wished to influence. Joyce, inhibited neither by a patriotic nor a strategic regard for the faith of his fathers, and certainly not by a timid or prudent disinclination to give offence, addressed the religious issue with marked candour. I do not see, he stated categorically, what good it does to fulminate against the English tyranny while the Roman tyranny occupies the palace of the soul. Dubliners is a book of churches. In story after story, we learn of church buildings, church institutions, pious practices and traditions, of feast days, religious attitudes and assumptions, and of the ubiquitous catechism, which even the atheistic Mr. Duffy, in A Painful Case, numbers among his literary possessions. The first, and what was to be the last stories in the collection, The Sisters and Grace, The Dead, was completed and added subsequently in 1907, sometime after the completion of A Little Cloud, which was the 14th of the stories to be finished in mid-1906, take religious matter for their subject, and offer us peculiarly troubling images of Irish priesthood. Grace is the more frankly satiric of these two anti-clerical studies. It makes its point with a kind of feline glee, 
producing a portrait of a priesthood so corrupted by egregious complacency that the subject damns himself out of his own mouth. There is something appalling, to be sure, about such invincible spiritual ignorance as it is represented in the preposterous figure of Father Purden. But as with all satire, there is the risk that enjoyment of the victim's surgical flaying can vitiate the moral force of the work itself. The altogether less directly satiric story, The Sisters, allows in its somber and mysterious control of tone and its syntactical and verbal elisions no such readerly evasion of the terrible import of a profoundly troubling image of the enfeebled sacerdotal. Father Flynn is a paralytic whose past contains some unmentionable shame. Standing or lying in his coffin at the beginning of the book, he seems to cast an oppressive shadow over the whole, as a malign presence of which we are reminded each time we encounter the pervasive signs of that ecclesiastical influence on Dubliner's lives that he so unpleasantly represents. For this realist text, which attends so scrupulously to the details of Dublin's social and cultural geography, also requires its dramatis personae to play representative roles, Miss Ivers as the Irish Ireland Gwelgor, Little Chandler as the typical revival poetaster, the personified harp as Ireland, Father Flynn as the corrupted priest. Father Flynn at the outset seems indeed to set the stage for a social tableau of representative types. In fact, Joyce himself, in a famous letter to Grant Richards, encouraged such symbolic reading of his work. My intention, he wrote, was to write a chapter of the moral history of my country, and I chose Dublin for the scene because that city seemed to me the center of paralysis. I have tried to present it to the indifferent public under four of its aspects, childhood, adolescence, maturity, and public life. The stories are arranged in this order. That Father Flynn suffers a debilitating condition which some critics have even identified with the general paralysis of the insane, which characterizes the terminal stage of syphilitic infection. In a story which begins with a brooding on the word simony and paralysis, whatever we make of Noman, seems in the light of this letter to invest him with central symbolic significance in the text as a whole. The quotation from the letter also encourages the critic to read Dubliners not as a series of discrete stories, but as a work of complex structure in which the characters unknowingly arrange themselves in a modern version of an ancient trope, the ages of man. Many critics, of course, tend to read Dubliners as an apprentice work by the master who produced Ulysses with its deliberate and extended analogues to existing primary works of the imagination, the Odyssey, Hamlet. They have been encouraged by this letter which apprises them of the fact that the work was conceived as an integral thing, to treat the text as if Joyce had already developed in Dubliners the method he was to employ in so thoroughgoing a fashion in the later work. A hint by Joyce's brother Stanislaus seemed further to justify an exegetical game of Hunt the Analogue. In 1941, Stanislaus released the information that Grace was based on the triune structure of Dante's Divine Comedy, taking us from the inferno of the public house jakes through a purgatory of convalescence to an ironic paradise in Gardiner Street. This account of the matter was then developed by no less an authority than Stuart Gilbert, who, in 1946, argued that Joyce had employed in that remarkable story, Grace, a technique combining an apocalyptic background, that of the Dantean triptych, with wholly modern motifs. Further, in a BBC broadcast talk of 1954, Stanislaus reconfirmed the presence of a Dantean parallel to the structure of the teal. Significantly, the critics were more inclined to respond interpretively to this element in Stanislaus's talk than to his categorical denial that his brother had intended, as an earlier critic had argued, that Maria in clay should be both a witch and a figure of the Virgin Mary, as well as her own diminutive self. I am in a position, Stanislaus Joyce insisted, to state definitely that my brother had no such subtleties in mind when he wrote the story. Dubliners has therefore endured a considerable amount of rather mechanical symbol hunting 
as if the surface of the text with its realistic detail and subtleties of dialogue and socio-cultural allusion can be disregarded in pursuit of some definitive interpretation rooted in a symbology which the ingenious critic has identified. It is as damage done to those finely woven textures that constitute the work's finesse that these exercises in misguided scholarly acumen give most offence. For it is not that Dubliners does not possess a complex structure and a detailed symbolism for all the realism it also achieves, but that such readings direct attention away from a full encounter with the individual story itself to a reductive account of some altogether simpler narrative which is a poor substitute for the true Joycean experience. There is, of course, no doubt that Joyce, the disciple of Ibsen, was also deeply interested in the work of the French symbolist poets whose work he knew and whose literary movement he had learnt of in Arthur Simmons' pioneering study, The Symbolist Movement in Literature, 1899. But what Joyce took from symbolism was something radically different from what, for example, his fellow countryman, W.B. Yeats, to whom Simmons' book was in fact dedicated, took from it. For Yeats, symbolism offered a means whereby the poet might draw back the trembling veil of the visible to reveal transcendent realities beyond the corporeal world. He defined a symbol as the only possible expression of some invisible essence, a transparent lamp about a spiritual flame. For Joyce, a symbol was not so essential and therefore sacred a thing, nor was it a means to definitive truths. The symbol-hunting exegetes offer a mechanical and often vulgarized version of the Yitzian essentialism and transcendentalism, out of key with the subtle indeterminacy and this worldliness of the Joycean method. For Joyce, the symbolic power of writing lay in its capacity, as if it were a kind of revelation or manifestation to suggest mood, psychology, the moral significance of an occasion, without, and here Flaubert is mentor and not Ibsen, obstructive authorial presence or palpable design upon a reader. I am writing, Joyce told a friend in August 1904, as he embarked upon the work which would become Dubliners, a series of epicleti, ten, for a paper. I call the series Dubliners, to betray the soul of that hemiplegia or paralysis which many consider a city. The term epicleti here derives from the Greek Orthodox liturgy, which refers to the moment in a sacrifice of the Mass when the bread and the wine are transformed by the Holy Ghost into the body and blood of Christ. At this moment of consecration, the everyday realities of bread and wine are charged with spiritual significance. Given Joyce's employment of this term to describe his intentions in Dubliners, it is not surprising that commentators have made much of a similar use of a theological term in Joyce's Stephen Hero, which he was at work on concurrently with Dubliners. There he used the idea of epiphany, literally a manifestation, but theologically the feast commemorating the manifestation of Christ's divinity to the Magi, to write of an artist's duty as he saw it. By an epiphany he meant a sudden spiritual transformation, whether in the vulgarity of speech or of gesture or in a memorable phrase of the mind itself. He believed that it was for the man of letters to record these epiphanies with extreme care, seeing that they are the most delicate and evanescent of moments.